Good day, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our AIB webinar, uh, presenting some of our latest research from our two journals, Journal of International Business Studies and Journal of International Business Policy. Uh, we have created this forum about two years ago to talk about uh, research that's recently been published and talk about the broader implications from such research. Uh, before we start, let me thank uh, Digital Promotions that provide the technical support, as well as the AIB office, who is doing the logistics, and of course, the two journal editors and their teams that uh, secure that the work is uh, published in the first place. What we do, as many of the participants will know, we select three papers that have recently been published from either of the two journals that speak to one bigger question. Uh, and. Uh, that bigger question today is how does international business help or hinder public health uh, with a special interest in, in developing countries. Um, we also try to bring different uh, diversity of different people together, especially junior people and more senior people. And, and so we have an uh, open ended discussion. We encourage all the participants to actively uh, engage with the discussion. And please use the Q&A function for that. So you as participants can put questions in the Q&A, which our moderator, which today is Suma Athriya, uh, will pick up and then ask uh, the panelists. Uh, you can also like some of the questions and then move up and get the attention of the, the moderator. But um, So today's topic, public health, is a topic that we haven't really talked much about in the international business, but there have been a number of papers that start looking at that link and obviously in the background, probably COVID is, is a motivator for this, although the specific papers we are talking about today are not specifically about uh, COVID. But there are different arguments out there as to how international business either contributes to spread of diseases or other public health issues, but also how multinational companies potentially are part of the solution to public health challenges. And that's the sort of issues we want to explore today. With that, let me hand over to Suma. Please, Suma, uh, over to you. Thank you, Klaus. Um, public health invariably brings to mind the large pharmaceutical multinationals who are uh, revered and hated in equal measure. On one hand, students of management have long been fascinated uh, by the innovativeness of pharmaceutical m and uh, their unique routines and the audacity of ambition, to borrow a phrase from uh, Barack Obama, uh, that they showed in the early part of the 20th century. Those worried about public health, however, do not see them as knights in shining armor, quite the opposite. They see these same companies as the scourge of public health, uh, as firms that keep drug and vaccine prices high and would sacrifice human lives before the altar of profits. But today we are not going to start this discussion about um, today, we're going to start this discussion about international business and public health in more general terms. So we are not talking only about multinationals. We are also talking about international trade, migration, the movement of peoples from one place to another. Um, and so international business in more general terms and its effect on public health and the spread of communicable diseases. So to start us off on this journey, on this discussion, our first speaker is going to be Jung Hoon Park, uh, who's joining us today from New York. Over to you, Jung Hoon. Thanks, Suma. Uh, let me share my screen. Do you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for organizing this event, Klaus and Suma. Um, I'm really honored to present my paper, which has been published at Journal of International Business Studies, Business Studies this year. So in this study, we try to tackle or we try to investigate the connections between international business 
and communicable disease, basically infectious disease. And then this paper is co-authored with Ivan Montiel, City University of New York, myself also at the same institution, and then Brian Husted, Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico, and Andres Velez Calle, Univers University uh, EFID in Colombia. So basically this paper was motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And let's see what happened to Wuhan, to China, which has been considered the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, a basic pandemic star. So the then question is like, how this like um, the emergence of this COVID-19 virus spread over all around the world. So here's the here are some aspects of Wuhan. So Wuhan has like more than 10 million people, so much population there and the high population density because of the urbanized areas. And that Wuhan has been considered the industrial and transport hub status in China. So it has attracted like uh, global travel and the commercial activities. And according to BBC back in 2020, uh, out of these Fortune Global 500 firms, more than 200 multinationals had made like foreign direct investments in this city. So the, the question is, it seems that there is some connection between international business and this like the spread and or emergence of this um, communicable disease. So the question is like, under what conditions does international business actually facilitate the emergence and spread of communicable disease? So this is the main research question that we were trying to tackle in our study. So basically, uh, international business can affect different phases of a communicable disease pandemic. So pandemic is not the like very beginning point. So it so it starts from few human infections, and then it also it could progress into epidemics, more like uh, localized widespread human infections and transmission. And the, if epidemics like spread all over the world, it could be evolved into pandemics, which, more, which is more like transnational widespread human infection. So as I said, communicable disease is a sort of infectious disease. And then these are the disease caused by pathogenic microorganisms, such as like viruses or bacteria or fungi. So this disease can be spread or directly or indirectly from one person to another. So it has the potential um, to be spread over like across the nations, uh, across different regions, across different cities within the country. So that's why we thought that because IB basically focuses on cross-border activities and the IB is not just about global phenomena. Sometimes IB also needs to take attend to, uh, attend to like localized issues. So that's why we thought that IB should have some connections between um, with this like the emergence of epidemics and then the progression of epidemics into pandemics. So we focus on the emergence of epidemics in host countries, like host countries um, in the more like IB setting and then how IB fosters the progression of epidemics to global pandemics. So this is our sort of general framework that we adopted in our study. So we try to begin with uh, take taking a look at the historical evidence. So it's not a new phenomenon. So basically international trade had, which is considered the part of the international business activities has contributed to emerging or like spreading of communicable disease. So um, plague of Justinian, which is the very first um, like massive pandemic um, in our world. So international trade, international trade was considered uh, to contribute to this uh, plague of Justinian. And then Black Death, it was also known, uh, the cause was known as the trade routes um, uh, from China to Black Sea and the smallpox also trade and the flu pandemic uh, also it spread out from Asia to Europe via trade routes and the yellow fever, Manchurian plague and the Spanish flu. It's hard to dis, uh, distinct, um, it's hard to tease out from the, the effects of World War I from international trade but at least there has been some connections between international trade and the spread of, uh, and the emergence and spread of Spanish flu. And then SARS also, also was known uh, as being aggravated through the international trade, travel and then trade and the COVID-19 also the same. 
So the historical evidence briefly showcases that there is some connection between international business and communicable business. So what we were actually trying to do is try to delve into the contemporary evidence uh, that we build on the some insights from the public health field. So then like how actually international business, different international business activities, different international business contextual factors foster the emergence and spread of communicable disease. So building on this framework, we identify eight different factors. So there are two categories. They are more like sort of contextual factors uh, attached to international business phenomena. And then there are like multinational activities because I mean, there are like different types of companies, but in the IB setting, multinationals are considered the primary actor. So that's why we identify these two different categories. And then there are like uh, four different factors that affects the emergence of epidemics in host countries. And there are another four factors that foster the progression of epidemics into global pandemics. So these are the eight factors. So in the localized widespread uh, host countries, regulatory quality, urbanization, and then for multinational activities, foreign direct investment, corporate political activity, uh, we identify these four factors. And then for the factors that foster the progression of epidemics into global pandemics, we identify another four factors, trade barriers, global migration, global supply chain management, and international travel. So because of the limited time, I want to showcase uh, four factors that I wanted to introduce in terms of the mechanisms through which these factors or multinational activities foster the emergence or spread of communicable disease. So host country regulatory quality, trade barriers, foreign direct investment, and global supply chain management. So this is these are the four factors that I wanted to introduce. So we have more mechanisms in our uh, introduced in our study, but here I just wanted to briefly showcase like how actually host uh, countries regulatory quality could increase the likelihood of emergence of epidemics, communicable disease epidemics. So we focus on, let's say, weak nutrition regulations. It sounds like, okay, how does them, how do weak nutrition regulations of the host country aggravate or foster, facilitate the emergence of epidemics? So here is why. So basically, weak nutrition regulation could allow some multinationals, especially in like food or like beverage or like some like unhealthy commodity multinationals to tap into like processing, marketing, and retailing of these unhealthy food commodities. And then it could increase the possibility that host country citizens are exposed to these unhealthy food commodities. And then they may have, they may lose, they may lose like, um, like access to more like healthy commodity options. So it might aggravate the nutritional deficiency, especially in the context of developing countries. And then it could weaken their immune system ability to fight infections from communicable disease. Then it could sort of lay the foundation of, um, the, in terms of the conditions um, that the increase the or foster the, the emergence of this communicable disease, which, which could be progression into the emergence of epidemics. So this is what we focus on. So it's not like we try to like just focus on some direct connections between the host country regulatory quality and communicable disease, but rather we try to see some like different steps that we could uh, build on because like non-communicable disease, this nutritional deficiencies have been considered as the cause of this like cause of spreading the communicable disease. And the, another contextual factor that uh, foster the few human infections into epidemics is the foreign direct investment. In our paper, we focus on two different types of foreign direct investment activities, um, like resource extractive uh, related FDI, and then this like some FDI try to exploit these low wage havens. So some FDI has some purpose to, a purpose of accessing cheap labor in the low wage havens then it could generate some local effects of this downward pressure across multinational value chains to save some operational costs. And it could increase concentration of multinationals in a like given urban area and then lead to low wages and then like unsafe working conditions and then like um, lower level of compliance with this like some health or environmental standards that could like 
create some like favorable conditions of uh, for emerging this like communicable disease uh, between like different humans across like different like uh, regions or cities in the host country. So it could increase the likelihood of the emergence of epidemics. And in terms of the factors that foster the progression of epidemics into pandemics, like global pandemics, um, here in terms of the contextual factor, the, the trade barriers could also affect uh, this um, epi the evolution of epidemics into pandemics. So for instance, non-tariff trade barriers like quota or a sanction. So as we have observed during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there, there, was, there were some export, export restrictions on like some essential medical supplies, like masks um, and protective like equipment and then vaccines. And then, of course, be, uh, these non-trade, non-tariff trade barriers, like export restrictions here, it could increase prices and then limit the availability of health-related essentials. Then, of course, that could magnify the supply chain issues, like disruptive supply chains. Then, especially like people in developing countries um, might have like less access to this like essential medical supplies or vaccines, as we already have observed. Then that could increase the likelihood of this epidemics progression into pandemics because they may miss the like golden time to prevent epidemics into developing into pandemics. So that's why we thought that non-territory barriers also could play a role in uh, progressing the epidemics into pandemics. And in terms of multinational activities, we also uh, try to zero in on global supply chain management. So basically, a lot of multinationals, they possess like this uh, a wide variety of suppliers uh, across different countries. So sometimes that could increase the monitoring costs, and then sometimes that could hinder a multinational's ability to effectively monitor its supply chain across borders. Then, which means there will be some, there may be some complex coordination among like different stakeholders in these global supply chains, and then that could hinder also information flows and then this monitoring. So for multinationals, it could be really difficult, it could be really challenging to monitor their lower tier suppliers for their compliance with like health, labor, environmental standards to prevent the onset of communicable disease epidemic. As I discussed um, in the FDI section, like poor compliance with these like health, labor, environmental standards could um, may generate some favorable conditions of like facilitating emergence of communicable disease uh, between humans and then between cities, between different regions in the host country, then these epidemics could, if multinationals don't effectively monitor this, their supply chain across borders, it could also lay the foundation for pandemics. So that's why we assume that it would increase the likelihood of epidemics progression into pandemics. So these are the four factors that I wanted to showcase in terms of how we build up our mechanisms through which international business fosters the emergence and spread of communicable disease. So based on our based on our study, we suggest that IB scholars or business scholars in general, we may need to consider embracing these health-related discussions in the IB study. As Klaus introduced our today's webinar at the beginning, um, Klaus mentioned that there has been not much actual study talking about the health-related phenomena in the IB field, despite the some sort of close connections between the two. So F, because we are now experiencing the, all the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic. So as an IB scholar, as an academic, we could bring something up in terms of like by embracing these health related discussions in our IB studies. And then as we did in our study, we need, inter, uh, we need an interdisciplinary approach we had to take a look at a lot of public health studies like environmental science because they have some like contemporary evidence um, that help us make this like sort of seemingly unrelated dots um, to link this uh, link the connection between IB, international business and communicable disease. So approach, um, adopting this interdisciplinary approach would be needed to conduct any health related studies in the business field. And then for practitioners, Maybe if we want to prevent the emergence and spread of communicable disease onset, we may need to think about how multinationals can use their core capabilities to improve health 
and how they can integrate these public health tools and the knowledge into their company strategic decisions, and then how they can reduce the risk of syndemics. Syndemics is a combined sort of effects of like different types of disease. When uh, people with underlying like health conditions would suffer more from this like virus or COVID-19 pandemic than uh, people with no underlying conditions. So syndemics is something that we also need to think about. It's not just about like infectious disease or pandemics. There are some aggravated effects if there is the exist existence of non-communicable disease like obesity, diabetes. So for firms, for multinationals, they may want to think of how to reduce the risk of syndemics in communities where their company operates. And then also think of engaging in cross-sector health partnerships. So this is the summary of our, uh, of our study and thanks for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jung Hoon. And um, of course, you know, uh, the COVID-19 crisis showed us that international business kind of at that time at least uh, failed spectacularly. And so it was up to national governments to do what they could to scramble for vaccines or vaccine procurement or create vaccine capacity. And the next two papers in this webinar are going to look at the efforts of uh, Brazil and South Africa respectively, uh, confronted with a situation where the pandemic was tearing into their population, but uh, there was very little help coming from uh, global supplies of vaccines. Um, and uh, there were other bottlenecks like the availability of raw materials for vaccines and testing kits and so on. So the next two papers um, will discuss what was the response of host governments in developing economies like Brazil and South Africa, who were uh, actually quite badly punished by the pandemic. Um, the first speaker is, uh, the next speaker is going to be Paula Perez Altman uh, from the University of Montreal. She'll talk about uh, the Brazilian effort, not only for COVID, but for all other tropical disease vaccines in general. Um, and over to you, Paula. Thank you, Suma. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, Paula. All right, thank you. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conversation uh, focused on international business and public health. Uh, I'm sharing with you today uh, to contribute to our discussion, a paper we recently published in the Journal of International Business Policy uh, that focuses on innovation capabilities in um, emerging and developing economies and uh, the setting is um, uh, uh, technologies related to global health, uh, to in particular, uh, to neglected tropical diseases. Uh, this is a paper uh, that uh, I co-author uh, with Tommaso Ferretti. And the issue here that drove this paper was understanding how developing and emerging economies build innovation capabilities uh, to create new products, new technologies. So we're talking about the creation of new knowledge. And uh, here, uh, for the purposes of this study, uh, we zeroed in on health technologies uh, related to diseases that are very relevant in uh, the developing world. Uh, and in fact, they are associated, let's say the, the, the term itself, neglected tropical diseases, all right? If you think of the map of you know, the tropical countries, um, there is obviously an overlap uh, with, the, the, with developing countries, but they are neglected because there has been very little investment in uh, drugs or vaccines or diagnostics uh, to uh, deal with these diseases. And where some names may be very familiar to you, like if you hear dengue, uh, jong -un mentioned earlier Zika, uh, but you know other names could be Chagas, leptospirosis, 
uh, trypanosomosis, leishmaniasis. And according to the World Health Organization, there are about 1.7 billion people in the world that are affected by these diseases that they put in the list about 20 uh, diseases. So these are chronic infectious diseases. So, you know, as opposed, let's say, to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we're talking here about chronic uh, infectious diseases. Now, in the literature uh, on international business and the literature on innovation in developing economies, uh, typically, let's say there's been the role of the multinational companies has uh, been highlighted, and uh, also uh, the role of knowledge networks. Uh, we know that in innovation processes in general, uh, you know, sourcing of knowledge, external sourcing of knowledge is, is very relevant. And so we know that uh, these interactions through uh, inter-organizational uh, ties matter a lot as conditions for uh, innovations or uh, the facilitate innovation. <clears throat> now, the literature has also highlighted the role of public organizations, in particular public research organizations. And in this particular paper, as we uh, you know, dug into this uh, research, the role of a public uh, research organization became very relevant. And we zeroed in on Brazil because uh, in addition that I do, my work is generally focused on Latin America, Brazil was doing uh, things uh, to develop uh, new technologies around neglected diseases. So trying to understand how it was that they're building uh, capabilities in new areas uh, that they had not done before became the focus uh, of the study and centered around what this organization was doing. That, as it turns out, is, a, is very important in the health innovation complex in Brazil, but also in Latin America in general, it stands out. So uh, given that collaborations are very important uh, in the literature as already established, let's say, when we think about innovation dynamics, uh, this became also the focus to, uh, of the site to look at what's happening around then collaborations to uh, source knowledge uh, or to develop new knowledge. So let me um, show you here. Uh, the next uh, slide is on uh, one of the findings that we report there in the paper is the growth of knowledge networks for innovation. And um, we see over a period, we, uh, we collect data here from uh, actually the 1900s till 2015. Uh, and uh, we see a, a, a growth, a dramatic growth of uh, innovation uh, networks or, or, or of collaborations, let's say, between Fiocruz, which is the Brazilian organization dedicated to public research in health, and uh, other organizations. Uh, especially, as you can see here in the curve, uh, we see it uh, doubling uh, in the 90s and then actually grows sixfold in the 2000s. And uh, of course, we see it also uh, continuing to grow into the 2010s. Now, a key thing to keep in mind here, and this is what we develop in the paper, is uh, what is happening uh, to uh, the goals that Brazil is setting out as to why it became uh, uh, an important uh, issue to uh, promote innovation, uh, to develop technologies to address neglected diseases that were very relevant for Brazil. And here we, we discuss in the paper the evolution in the social policy, the social goals that Brazil sets out, uh, particularly in the late 1980s, 1988 onwards, and its innovation policies, where we see a very relevant dynamic, between, an integration between social policy goals and innovation policy goals. Uh, just to highlight in this case that um, we uh, have uh, a social policy goal in the 1988 with their constitution that sets it out as a right of every citizen to have access to health. But this is also, go along with this, there are policies that are trying to increase access to healthcare to all the citizens in Brazil, which of course has uh, high levels of poverty and uh, large uh, uh, numbers of the population that are uh, marginalized. And so this policy for them it becomes very relevant on how then do you provide uh, ways in which you're going to improve the health and well-being of the population. Now, this is very interesting for us as we look back at this experience with Brazil. 
Brazil, because I think it also ties in with what's going on with the sustainable development goals, where uh, health and well-being is uh, a, an important one, is goal number three. So we feel that this is uh, certainly uh, very relevant here for thinking about that. So we see that uh, their uh, social uh, policy goal drives this innovation uh, policy goals and promotes um, that that the research organization begins to also drive its innovation uh, focus around health technologies. Now, one thing that's very relevant here is that they, what do these networks look like? And here briefly, let me just highlight that uh, they obviously have ties to national organizations like universities that began to uh, establish uh, collaborations with Fiocruz, but importantly, they also promote ties to international organizations, to foreign organizations. So, you know, we would typically think, yes, multinationals, yes, they come into the picture, but they are not the only ones. They are also establishing ties with other uh, institutions, non-governmental organizations, as well as with other uh, governmental organizations, research organizations, universities uh, around the world. And they're very proactive, actually, about creating uh, a lot of consortia uh, that became very well known actually internationally in the realm of global health. So they are targeting their local problems, but also connecting to the reality that when it comes to neglected diseases, these are global problems. And so uh, one of the famous ones that you may have heard, for example, is the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative that was led by Brazil to connect with other countries and other famous NGOs like the Doctors Without Borders to uh, bring attention to diseases that had only uh, 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 received about 1% of R&D funding in the past until you know, the late 90s. So that's uh, important then, this increasing connection. Uh, now, another thing that we highlight in the paper is that these relationships as they're building, they're moving from uh, if you look at the, what they were doing in these collaborations in the 70s and the 80s, they were mostly around technology transfer and, and much more about production capability building. So if you were talking about polio vaccines, you know, that would be uh, one aspect. But instead, as the uh, collaborations grow, they will become much more focused on research uh, and development. So that's uh, important there. <clears throat> The next thing is, of course, that we see growing patenting activity uh, with Brazil very much at the center when we're talking here about uh, patenting related to neglected uh, diseases. And uh, so this is, is something that we uh, talk about, you know, the development of vaccines, the development of therapeutics, the development of diagnostic uh, tests. The, 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 this is very important because you had situations where you couldn't even diagnose the diseases that people had because there were no tests to be able to do it. And Brazil uh, assumes very uh, the, 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 the goal of developing in all these three different areas. Uh, Next, let me just say that the relationship with multinationals is very uh, interesting here because, uh, of course, in international business, they are always uh, very central to these dynamics. But keep in mind that this is an area where the multinationals have had very little interest commercially uh, in investing in these kinds of the, in these neglected diseases. In fact, you know, the term comes precisely because <laughs> there was no commercial interest here. So, but still they are very important uh, initially, if we look at this over time, as I said, in terms of the early 70s and the 80s, um, where they're doing a lot of technology transfer, but these are for existing products and Brazil is developing production capabilities. And these are mostly bilateral relations with very few multinationals. What's interesting is that the more that they drive, that Brazil drives the goal of promoting innovation, uh, the, the move to increase research collaborations and more development uh, activities and new products that are not part of the portfolio of multinationals at that time, but also multinationals uh, increase their more multinationals that come in, so they diversify relations with multinationals, and the multinationals are not just engaging bilateral relations, but they're also part of these consortiums and uh, multi-organizational networks that are being driven by the public research organization of uh, Brazil. And uh, this, uh, I will stop there, uh, just to say that in terms of future directions, 
I think of what we learn when you focus on health uh, and we connect to the sustainable development goals uh, is that there is a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, context here for us to ask and discover different dynamics in the relationships. Uh, and I mentioned here multinationals because they have been so central actors, of course, to the field of international business. But we need to expand more uh, the research on how um, uh, companies are interacting with uh, public research organizations and others that are, uh, are working very actively in developing and emerging economies around the sustainable development goals. I think that it's wide open. We are looking here uh, at this health issue as the focus of today's webinar, but it certainly gives space for many of the other goals. The other thing is that we need to give a more, uh, uh, more agency to the role of developing and emerging economies in pursuing innovation, particularly when we're talking about social sectors and uh, you know, the SDGs, uh, we are in a field that gives agency to the multinationals. But when it comes to issues of social and environmental issues, I think that we need to give agency uh, to those contexts where they're operating. And here, the last one that I'm going to say is the role of policies, which is being highlighted in the Journal of International Business Policy. I think that that is also a very relevant area. There's been a lot around trade policy, a lot around FDI policy, but all the policies around the social policies that are being that are on the rise, also in connection to the social to the sustainable development goals, or if they are set as uh, priorities by developing and emerging economies, provide a context where we can see they can drive also the behavior and how and the strategies of multinational companies, as we see in the case of neglected tropical diseases in Brazil. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. That's a, a very, very, very clear presentation. I enjoyed reading the paper. I have enjoyed the presentation. Um, I think a very interesting uh, thing that you have emphasized is the role of social actors, apart from the government, in pushing uh, innovation policies towards uh, neglected areas. And I hope we come back to this in the discussion. But let me hand over to Rory without further ado to, to talk about South Africa and uh, South Africa's experience with building vaccine capacity. Over to you, Rory. Thank you, Suma. And thank you so much to uh, Suma, Klaus, and the AIB team for organizing the webinar. Uh, so this is a paper that was published in Journal of International Business Policy as part of the special issue on global value chain oriented policies. The initial draft was submitted in March, April, 2020. So just as the pandemic was breaking out. So it's largely a pre COVID paper, but it very much speaks to, I think, some ongoing tensions in relation to global versus local sourcing in the pharmaceutical industry, which I'll, I'll come back to at the end. So, in, in terms of thinking about global value chains and development, much of the research is really thinking about the opportunities for export oriented development and where states are largely considered to play some kind of a facilitator role to help uh, industry or local firms and their prospects for reaching export markets in other parts of the world. But in the context of the formation of global value chains, there's been a significant concentration of global production in certain winning places, particularly in Asia, uh, obviously in China for many industries, but in a sense, in generic pharmaceuticals, India has played this role. This creates a lot of challenges for domestic production in these industries in other parts of the world. And there's well-documented trends towards deindustrialization in many economies. Uh, so what I'm trying to do here is think about the competitive challenges that are facing what I refer to as market seeking uh, imports supplied through global value chains. Uh, in the international business distinction between uh, attractions to places in terms of asset seeking or market seeking for the most part, uh, be 
and what I'm going to talk about here is how Indian pharmaceutical firms largely see South Africa and indeed many other African countries as largely an attractive market, but see very little attraction in terms of local assets for production, and therefore want to supply finished products, which creates a lot of challenges for local production. So to give a brief introduction to the South African pharmaceutical industry, which is the main case study, which this paper revolves around, uh, the country had quite a bit of pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity uh, built up under trade protectionism during the apartheid era. But there, in a sense, has been a significant downgrading or decline in the number of pharmaceutical manufacturing entities within the country, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Many uh, multinationals headquartered in Europe and America concentrated their production at centers of excellence elsewhere and closed their local manufacturing units in South Africa. There was some transition towards generic manufacturing and the rise of big South African firms, including Aspen and Adcock Ingram. But the sector is quite limited in that it's, apart from a very small exception, almost exclusively focused on the formulation stage of the value chain. This is the stage where a drug is uh, turned into a liquid, a tablet, a capsule, the common formats in which we consume a medicine, but there's little production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. So there's a, a significant limitation that that part of the value chain is exclusively import oriented. The production that does take place is very much for the most part domestic market oriented, and there's a huge trade imbalance in relation to the sector of imports vastly, vastly exceeding exports. So there's, and in a sense, the, the sector and the country has become quite reliant on imports of pharmaceuticals over the last couple of decades, and this is a wider trend found elsewhere in much of the African continent and indeed beyond Africa in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, there's a graph here on the right just showing the big rise in share of uh, India's share of South Africa's pharmaceutical imports. This is measured in dollar terms, but bear in mind that these are largely generic pharmaceuticals, which would cost less than those imported from Europe and North America. So the, the, the volume terms is actually a significant percentage higher would be coming from India. There's major advantages that Indian firms have in terms of economies of scale, access to raw materials, capabilities to reduce across a variety of quality standards. And in the interviews, which I should have mentioned, that the paper is based on about 30 interviews with different stakeholders in South Africa and builds on longer standing research on India's pharmaceutical industry in India and elsewhere. Uh, in talking to many Indian firms, they found very little attraction for manufacturing in South Africa or for any kind of asset seeking motivation. They see South Africa as a market to import finished pharmaceuticals into, and there's only a very small number of Indian firms that have a local manufacturing presence, but many do have an almost, well, all have marketing partnerships with local entities as a regulatory requirement in order to access the local market. There's very conflicted responses, which I think speaks directly to the theme of this webinar in terms of whether international business helps or hinders public health. And I put a quote here from the former Minister of Health in South Africa. We regard India as the pharmacy of the developing world. Uh, my message to India is we rely on them and if they reverse their position now, we will end up killing a lot of people in Africa, no, uh, no question about it. This was in relation to a discussion about a potential reform of patent law at that time. But the, sorry, the, the broader point here is that he is speaking to this notion of India as a pharmacy to the developing world and a term initially coined by activists from the Medicine Sans Frontier, pointing to the huge benefits for public health that have come about through supplies of pharmaceuticals from India. Most noticeable, of course, in the supply of antiretroviral medicines, uh, which cost $10,000 a year until the early 2000s when Indian companies started selling them for $300 a year and now less than $100 a year. This impact is huge in South Africa, the country with the highest 
incidence of HIV AIDS in the world, a country whose life expectancy fell from the mid 60s to mid 50s in the first uh, decade following the end of apartheid, but which has since actually increased again by about 10 years back up to the, to about 65 in by the mid uh, 20 teens. So a huge positive health impact from the imports of pharmaceuticals from India, especially. But a quote on the other side from a policymaker in uh, South Africa, well, lamented, well, they presented images, as missionaries, the pharmacy of the developing world. It's fantastic for antiretrovirals, but at the same time, they're undermining the capacity of our, our generic industry. We can't blame the Indians. They are, have 1.3 billion people. What, pharmaceuticals is one of their success stories. And a link here to the struggles for local industrial development and manufacturing capacity in light of the low cost pharmaceuticals that are being imported from India. And more broadly then, given these conflicted implications for public health versus local manufacturing, there's also been tensions in the state policy response. The South African state has tried to facilitate local pharmaceutical manufacturing through various industrial policy initiatives and incentives and enhancement programs. But they've really struggled to grow uh, local manufacturing. The state does play an important regulatory role, but for the most part, there's little industrial, explicit industrial policy dimension in that. And so in light of the struggles through the state's facilitatory and regulatory role, a lot of attention has focused on the buyer role or public procurement. Uh, the South African pharmaceutical market is one where public procurement is a key part of the market, estimated to be about 30 to 40 percent in, in value terms and a lot higher in proportion of volume of drugs. It's one shaped by the Ministry of Health uh, and where the Ministry of Health, for the most part, has largely seen uh, the goal of public procurement is providing good quality drugs uh, at so long as they meet sufficient quality standards at wherever the lowest supplier is, which of course is often import, uh, an import source from India. So a local uh, CEO of a South African pharmaceutical firm who I representative who I interviewed here referred to the need to expand manufacturing in South Africa. Uh, you've got to provide incentives that, to, to the same levels that Indians are at to get us to compete. And I'm not sure if our government would do that. Uh, and then another referred to inconsistencies in the preferences and tenders. A tender comes up, uh, but then the next tender, it's not clear what whether the uh, consistency is there and there's no coordination between the Department for Trade and Industry and the Ministry of Health. The DTI concerned with promoting local manufacturing, the Ministry of Health's primary concern with supplying medicines to the 40 plus million South Africans who rely on public sector provisioning. And so a lot of tensions here between health versus industry in terms of the policy response. So I think there's various issues this paper throws up in terms of the industry health relationship. Uh, a, a lot of challenges facing local pharmaceutical and COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing. Local production is not a new agenda. It's been discussed in South Africa and elsewhere for more than 20 years, yet it's an agenda which has become really augmented and attracted much wider attention in light of the pandemic, where countries, including South Africa, expected to be exported vaccines through COVAX and through direct supply, but, all, but many of those initial export promises did not materialize. There's tensions here between the short-term health need and of getting medicines wherever they come from at the best value, versus longer term health interests in promoting greater domestic production capacities and therefore uh, reducing health insecurity. And I think this is a really important tension to think about in terms of future research. There's also important tensions between the producer as implications of, for example, imports of pharmaceuticals from India with, in a, in a sense, many negative implications and significant competitive challenges versus the consumer benefits that come from more affordable imported medicines. So I think there's, a, there's an important policy agenda emerging about the possibilities for domestic production 
in the context of import orientation. This is very timely in the pharmaceutical sector in light of the pandemic, but it's one which I think uh, is also relevant to other industries too. Uh, and, and key questions about what roles can states actually play in these contexts? Can the facilitatory role often associated with export oriented production, can that really transform domestic production and can states be more active in regulatory and also buyer roles? So those are just some of the issues which I think are emerging uh, from this paper and I'm really looking forward to uh, any questions and discussions on this? Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Um, there's a question from, um, in, it's in the chat, uh, not in the question and answer, from Yuri Senyuik. Um, the question reads, first of all, what do we mean by the concept of public health? Is it expanded reproduction of the population or the treatment of diseases or fighting a pandemic? Depending on the answer to this question, the understanding of the relationship between public health and IB concepts is changing as well, isn't it? So I guess that's first and foremost to you, Jungun, and but also to uh, the other two speakers who in any case, I think took a broader view of the relationship between public health and IB. Thanks, Uma. Uh, I just actually typed my answer in the chat. So that's a great question. And then whenever I try to write up a health paper, I think that's the sort of core question that we need to tackle. What does it mean by public health, um, especially from the business perspective? But your question to me sounds like a means to an end. So basically, like there are different ways in which we can tackle like different health issues. So we could focus on like reproduction or like the treatment issues or like certain sort of strategic tools to prevent some disease from uh, um, like evolving, uh, they're evolving into like pandemics, for instance. So I think what we may need to focus on in terms of the definition of public health is the end, what is the end goal of public health? So basically according to the WHO, public health refers to the like improving health, prolonging life, improving the quality of life among the whole populations through health promotion, disease prevention, and other forms of health intervention. So in my study, I focus on more like the um, communicable disease and the how actually international business can, so I try to see the like opposing story, like negative story so that we can secure where we can seek more like sort of uh, positive solutions to uh, preventing communicable, the spread, the emergence and spread of communicable disease. So um, I think, yeah, that could be my answer in terms of the definition of public health. Rory and Paula, would you like to take a shot at it as well? In the context of South Africa and Brazil, how would you define the public health problem? Well, I, I agree. I think that the WHO definition is, is, you know, I think it applies whether we're talking about chronic, um, you know, infectious diseases or whether we're talking about a pandemic, I think that the, so I, I, I agree with that, you know, that it's talk about improving health, improving the quality of life, uh, dealing with um, health promotion, disease prevention. And I think what happens in a pandemic is that you're talking about an emergent disease, right? So it's sort of like emerges suddenly and, and obviously uh, it spreads. So it may not have been a part of your ongoing public health programs, right? But it, it can certainly take over, you know, if if it spreads as as, as in the case of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So uh, I, I think th that would be to me the differentiator. I mean, a, a pandemic obviously is also related to public health, uh, you know, and, and in fact, how you approach it might stop it from becoming, you know, a crisis, right? Preventing its spread uh, or how you manage it once, uh, it has spread can also um, affect how long it's going to be affecting the population and 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 uh, and how much. So I think I mean looking back, uh, I'm reminded there of the context of the AIDS crisis in Brazil. You know, so um, for them that became uh, you know if you were you know they, they, they that became a very central for their public health uh, programs. 
and um, it was a major crisis where uh, the mortality rates were very high. They had no way, uh, uh, no, no access to technologies at the time, and they worked very hard to to turn that around. So uh, I would say, you know, this difference here between fighting, uh, you know, a, a crisis, right, like a pandemic, and um, or chronic ones, or public health. I think you know, we're, we're talking about public health in general. It, it's just um, an issue of uh, the emergency that it creates in the, in the if it was, if, when it's something so emergent like, like what we had recently. Rory, do you wanna to add to that? Uh, only very briefly, I think what Paolo touched on the end, the example of the AIDS crisis, I mean, that's hugely prominent in the South African uh, context where this is a phenomena that really, it wasn't about what happened to one individual. This was something that uh, uh, issue which affected a vast number of people within the country and had huge knock-on implications for life expectancy, for people's livelihoods, for huge economic consequences to that arise from that. Uh, so it's uh, a very kind of widespread phenomenon that that affects the. Uh, much beyond one single individual. Okay, uh, we don't seem to have that many questions from the audience yet. Um, so maybe I can ask one of my own to sort of kickstart a bit of a discussion. Do you think um, that uh, the recent uh, uh, epidemics, whether it was AIDS or it was the more recent COVID, um, refocus the need to create national uh, production capacity in certain crucial drugs because the scale of let's say AIDS was so so bad that I think at one point even if all the multinationals did want to uh, you know uh, serve the world it, it, the, the people infected with AIDS they may not have been able to just as happened during COVID, there was a supply bottleneck. So do you think that these pandemics have the effect of refocusing attention on national capacities? And there's another question in the meantime. Uh, those, the, I, I can start if you want from, yes, please. Um, you know, what, if we look at the recent experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what we saw is that the technology, the vaccine was developed in, in, in uh, the US and Europe uh, and uh, access to that technology became widely available in North America and in Europe. Uh, but if we look at the African countries, uh, they had very little access to that, and still, you know, very low uh, vaccination rates. And uh, as a result, I think many African governments began, uh, you know, they they began to see that they um, uh, are at a disadvantage because they had no production capabilities, uh, you know, to produce the vaccines uh, that um, uh, were needed. And I think we've we've seen. Um, at least in the news anyway, their effort to uh, change that. And um, the question is what's going to be their strategy to do it in a way that it's really going to build local capabilities. Uh, because what I have seen is, or, or heard but in, from the news is that they're talking about multinationals setting up production centers uh, in, you know, in an African country, be that South Africa or be that let's say Ghana or that, but, um, you know, that isn't enough. I think what we can learn from the Brazilian experience is that you really need to build, uh, if you want to avoid being in that uh, scenario where you have no production capabilities or eventually develop, uh, you know, other technologies, other vaccines. And I think South Africa, you hear that they're saying, hey, we want to develop our own vaccine too. And, and they have, they did contribute some uh, import, important science uh, data uh, to, to that to that process. But my point is that they really need to build local capabilities then uh, rather than depend on whether uh, you know, Pfizer will decide or not to build the production center, because even then uh, to have the production capabilities, you also need to you know, uh, have the, the skills. So how are you going to promote 
uh, building uh, the skills that are needed you know, to, uh, there are more science related. I think that it really, um, they, they, I think they want to do it. So the question is what's going to be their strategy and how they're going to promote collaborations also with multinationals in there, but it's not going to be only multinationals that are, by setting up production centers that's going to address this problem. Okay, so there are two more questions sort of along the same lines. The first one is Beth Bacha, who suggests that in the IV and public health partnership, which of the following is right? Non-tariff trade is fueling pandemics, use of the network to strengthen the health response, interdisciplinary actions to support a global network of healthcare, and research and development through national or local initiatives. Following that, we also have a I mean, so this is just a comment to say, is this the, 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 the sequence? And then Anz Kolk has asked for Rory, how are farmer GVCs and GPNs affected structurally by COVID in terms of who produces what, where, et cetera? So there's a question for Rory and there's a sequence that Abacha sets out, which suggests that, you know, if we want to think about IB and public health, uh, is the following right? You know, so here's the sequence. And uh, I think that speaks to your paper, Junghoon. And Rory, the Anskok question uh, speaks to yours. So shall we start with Junghoon and then go on to Rory? So I was just wondering, because I, I can comment related to the previous question oh, as well. If, okay, does, yeah. Does that make sense? Is that okay, Junghoon? Oh, no, yeah. just to build, to build on what Paolo was saying, because I think that question about the efforts to build local and national capabilities relates to the future of pharmaceutical GVCs, uh, yes. and, and the, it, which is Anne's question. And I think, I mean, there's definitely a lot of renewed discussion around local production, local capabilities in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's not a new discussion in the African context where it's been discussed for 15, 20 years and policymakers have really struggled. In that time, the share of sourcing that's coming from local has not increased. So just talking about it, as we know, doesn't necessarily mean that it actually uh, mm -hmm. happens and it's a big struggle to deliver on. And I think one of the difficulties in promoting more local is capabilities is one, but capabilities in an adverse market environment are really challenging. So if you have domestic capabilities, but essentially your cost of production is still quite a bit higher than importing from elsewhere, which is the case with some very advanced pharmaceutical plants that already do exist in the African context, that's a real challenge for health policymakers. Do they pay more for with their limited health budget to buy drugs from a manufacturing plant within their territory versus, or do they try and get as much drugs or vaccines as they can in order to meet their health need? They might say, well, there's a short-term trade-off, we'll pay more in the short term, but that requires a belief and a plan that somehow local will necessarily become more cost-effective over time. There's a country coordination issue here as well, where in an African context, you're divided up into 54 countries. Uh, if Uganda produces uh, a drug, will the Kenyan Ministry of Health procure from it and see that as supporting its kind of broader African production, or will it procure directly from India, which may produce at a much higher volume and, and lower cost? So there's a key question to me about who what level of coordination is there going to be across countries? Who's going to finance the potentially increasing costs that are needed to develop domestic capabilities? And that may be long-term uh, in terms of industrial policy support, in terms of uh, finance, in terms of purchasing, guaranteed purchasing from local entities. So uh, I think there are, it has to go beyond talk into actually transforming the market dynamics of local because the era of lower trade barriers and trade liberalization has led to concentrations of production in particular places. So, sorry, I'm going on a, a long rigmarole here, but the, the short answer to Anne's question is I think there's a lot of talk 
of the changing uh, and a shift towards more local regional sourcing. But I think we still have to see the we have to see how this plays out. And it's easy for everybody to say we'll have more local, we'll promote more domestic capabilities in the context of an emergency and in the immediate aftermath of it. But whether that policy emphasis is still there in however many years time is remains to be seen. Thank you. Jung Hoon, you you have you have a lot to say there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have a lot to say, but uh, to about this question, I think, I mean, you already make a great suggestion, but in our study and then through the processes uh, to uh, uh, leading up to my like, like two different publications regarding the connection business and between business and health, what I noticed is that we need to draw insights from uh, what public health scholars have tried to investigate. So there is one example. I mean, I just shared the the one of the examples uh, regarding what public health scholars have been doing uh, in terms of corporate health impact assessment. So corporate health impact assessment is a sort of like overarching framework, uh, starting from like contextual factors, like including regulatory quality of host countries, and then multinationals like business activities and the, how those business practices and activities affect some like environmental social factors that have some health implications uh, in the end. So um, if we want to, if we think of like the partnership between international business and public health, um, first of all, I think we need to build on the, some sort of contemporary evidence that public health scholars provide to us, like how deforestation leads to the increase, uh, the increase in the likelihood of this emerging the infectious disease because of the disruptive surrounding environments and then how global migration um, is affected by climate change and how which could aggravate this the uh, the or facilitate the progression of epidemics into pandemics so using their sort of frameworks and then their like contemporary evidence that provided to us through their studies. Um, I guess that's the proper starting point, how we can build up some partnership between international business and public health. Because business scholars, I think we tend to maintain more like positive viewpoints of uh, towards business practices, uh, multinational activities, while public health scholars maintain a very negative stance against these like multinational activities. Basically for them, multinational activities are evil. So they ruin all the like public health issues um, across different regions, across different countries. So if we really want to build up some partnership between international business and public health, we need to acknowledge these kind of fundamental differences in our approaches and then perspectives. And then we try to sort of use what they provide in terms of scientific evidence and then build up some mechanism through which international business contributes or sometimes hinders um, the progression in improving public health. So that was sort of our main idea through our study. Thank you. So there's a, another really deep question from Sampada Dash, uh, which says that public health is a broader topic as not limiting only to pharmaceutical trade and there are healthcare facilities, stakeholders, communities, NGOs, government and intergovernmental organizations. So there has been a huge challenge in multi in managing multiple stakeholders in pandemic crises like G Zika or uh, COVID-19. So how is IV education currently addressing those issues through academic research? And what is the way forward? So I think there's a deep question because there's um, allusion not only to the different stakeholders in the process, uh, who may all contribute to the issue in different ways and may need to be managed differently but also that there is no coordinating organization between them, right? So what are we doing in IP education to improve this? Or should we regard this as something which is more in the domain of international relations? That's, that's not Sampada Dash's question, it's sort of my take on it. But um, anyway, that's for our panelists to comment on. Would you like to go first, Rory? I, I largely teach students on globalization, trade, and development rather than uh, conventional IB. So I'm not sure if uh, one of the other speakers would be. I can speak about that a little bit. I mean, to me, I think it's actually in uh, 
we have a lot of disciplinary boundaries in academia. And I think it's actually the empirical cases, including uh, both, uh, all, well, all of the papers that we presented here really force us as researchers often to kind of cross those boundaries. And I think whether whatever stage people are at, if students doing masters, PhD, other research, it's often the empirical problems that you encounter that force us to go beyond the existing boundaries where there is separation between, well, in my case, globalization and health or trade and health, but in, I imagine in other cases, different disciplines depending on, on those in question. So I think it's really important that we pay attention to the empirical problems on the ground and, and use those to kind of force us to reconsider conceptually and disciplinary our boundaries. Paula, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very important question. And uh, you know, for me, uh, I came to the international business field uh, do research on developing economies or em and emerging economies. And um, from the beginning, uh, it was clear that uh, to discuss, you know, international management in those contexts, you had to bring in the social element and the integration, let's say, of social and economic uh, perspectives to think about uh, strategy. You know, so. Uh, uh, I think, you know, it, it started from the beginning. <laughs> I know it wasn't certainly the dominant perspective. And uh, to also promote thinking of how, uh, you know, Western uh, companies were connecting and interacting with organizations in developing countries. And these were local firms, you know, indigenous firms, as well as other organizations such as governments or, you know, NGOs. And I think that, uh, you know, when I started this, uh, it was certainly not, um, you know, central to the to the IB field. What you see now in more discussions, uh, I th you know, in the journals, uh, in, in the Journal of International Business Studies, certainly you're seeing more of this opening, you know, as they in, in engage with the issues of the sustainable development goals and also realizing that there are, there are a wide variety of firms, a wide variety of organizations that uh, multinationals are interacting with. So I think, uh, that is important to bring, you know, more to to the mainstream in the field. And the the pandemic, you know, you used to. I remember talking to my students in the past about, you know, bringing the social to the economic, the thinking of social problems as opportunities, uh, the fact that you know the, the social challenges can certainly undermine the economic. And I think that having lived through the experience of the pandemic, it's a lot clearer for them how the social can totally affect the economic and how the economic cannot move forward unless you address the social elements. In this case, it says the health elements and the tremendous implications it has. So it's a pretty, when you talk about it now, you know, it's like they've lived through an experience that uh, when we were, when in the past, I, I had teach a course on strategic management for developing countries. So you will think about huge social problems and social challenges and how those were affecting business activities. But, you know, with the pandemic, everybody went through this major social problem that affected every, all the business activities. So, you know, they can, I think it's harder now to disconnect, you know, the social environmental and economic and the importance of international business, um, you know, of engaging it with those issues as opportunities and as moving forward. Uh, in the world. So for me, that's where it is. Uh, I have been <laughs> dealing with that, you know, from day one as I started as a professor, you know, uh, but I think, uh, you know, to, to um, uh, I don't see how we can continue, right, with just a very uh, economic and uh, uh, multinational centered view of, 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 of business. Uh, it, 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 I think we, we have learned a lot that they, of the importance and how much we can gain research-wise and uh, theoretically, I think, by bringing in these other dimensions. And for the students, it matters a lot so that they're better prepared uh, to manage uh, with the, the social challenges that are 
there are environmental challenges and using social because we're focusing on health, but obviously the environmental element obviously is central there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the way you posed it, Paula, it's not so far away from what orthodox IV theory is because, you know, a very dominant paradigm is the integration responsiveness paradigm. And this tells us that multinationals must always seek to balance the advantages of standardization with the particular adaptations needed in the social context, uh, in the in the regional or local context. I think the the difference is in what we are saying is that the social context is the context of disease in a country this which may be quite far removed from the multinational, and somehow this does not seem to have the same. Um, uh, this this does not seem to have the same effect as let's say adapting a soap to a hard water uh, condition or a soft water situation. Or this is the kind of adaptation that's normally talked about in responsiveness. So we have the tools in IV, uh, but uh, the social context doesn't seem to be taken as seriously. Uh, and you know, there's also the point that Jung Hoon made, which is that. Um, interdisciplinarity is very difficult. And I think these are both challenges for us to teach public health as part of you know, IB and to discover the connections between IB and public health. I think that's the way I would summarize it. So there is a, a, a few more interventions by uh, Yuri, uh, where he says that um, public health needs a broader understanding um, there should be uh, understanding of the post-pandemic economy as a bioeconomy of health. Uh, from this point, it would probably be right to make a special issue of uh, GIPS on this topic. Um, thank you, uh, Yuri from Ukraine, Technological National Science Technological Association. And if there are no more questions, um, I would like to hand over to you, Klaus, uh, to... Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a very stimulating uh, discussion. And got me thinking about a number of issues related to this particular aspect of international business. Um, and, and actually also realized the importance that we have more conversations around this. Someone suggested we have a special issue on that. Uh, Suma, over to you, to, if you think that you would be the right person to take initiative on that. I just want to comment on the question that we just had related to how do we bring it in the international business education. Um, I teach international business and I always have an ethical challenge uh, case built in. It's just one of the things I do. And I tend to use a medical one because it brings out a lot of the ethical tensions. Uh, Suma emphasized the uh, integration versus local responsiveness, but I think it's more, it's an issue of stakeholders in different countries of different views as what's the right thing to do, what's the ethically correct thing to do. And that is, in a lot of the debates that we've just had, it's, it's very obvious. In other issues, it's less obvious, it's more hidden, but in healthcare, there, the different stakeholders have, they have different views as what the pharmaceutical companies should be doing. And that's, in, in an education sense, what I can achieve with my students is to create a basic awareness of that. And then hopefully they will take that forward, right? It's the fundamental issues that we start every I, IB class. The main objective is get students to look at the world from a perspective of another country. It's sort of a very basic thing we, we do, but it's particularly important for healthcare. Um, <clears throat> I think I learned <clears throat> today also a lot about uh, policy. And the policy environment has a lot of different elements. We all know about very support for R&D. Um, we also know of the importance of skill formation. That applies to a lot of existing areas. Uh, one area that is normally considered very important, which we didn't talk about today, is intellectual property rights. That would probably an entire conversation separately uh, from, from what we've talked about today. Um, but one thing, especially with Rory's paper, but also the other papers, there is an important role for public procurement mm. yeah. that influences international trade and investment. And there's a tension, Rory brought this out very clearly, between the uh, national health system, which is uh, cash constraint, and those in government who want to develop industry, 
or we want to uh, increase more autonomy on, and, and, and reduce dependence, but the short-term decisions by the public procurement people is cost-focused. And there is a tension that every country has, and the smaller the country, the bigger that tension is. Um, that is an area where I think in the international business community, we haven't really dealt with this aspect of public procurement as a factor that influences international business and therefore international business policy. I think that's a very important point that I pick up from the conversation today. Okay, um, with, that, with those <clears throat> remarks, let me round, round up the, the conversation by saying thank you everyone for your uh, contributions. Um, Uh, okay, this is our seminars. Just to remind everyone, the papers we have listened today to, uh, are published. Uh, two of them are in advance online. Uh, one of them is in an issue. Actually, I have it right in front of me here in, in JIBP. Um, so you can go there and read the papers. Um, we thank the journal editors and my co-conspirator here in terms of organizing it, as well as the tech support for making all this happen. And last not least for everyone, you can find past webinars on YouTube. The website looks something like this. You type in Academy of International Business on YouTube and you'll find it. You may find it a very useful resource to find out different aspects of research that have been popular in recent times. And with that, I thank everyone for your contribution and please watch the your usual sources, whether it's Twitter or AIB list or uh, um, other sources AIB uses to disseminate information for whatever that seminars we come up with next. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.